Jesse Minter is a menace. The Chargers new defensive coordinator Jesse Minter had an interview yesterday where he talked about everything that he wanted to bring to this Chargers defense. But not only that, he talked about revitalizing Derwin James, and I also got some plays to break down from his defense and from our defense last year, which is not pretty. So make sure to like and subscribe if you do enjoy this content, bro. It helps me out so much. And now let's start off with what to expect from this Jesse Minter scheme. Certainly how we play, you know, and, and I talk about 50% being what you play and 50% being how you play. So what you play is is always evolving. You know, that's gonna be based on the players that we have, the opponents that we play, all the different quarterbacks that we have to play against. So I think that that evolves year to year, that evolves team to team. But what I really wanna do is build the identity of how we play. And that when you, when you line up to play against us, you kind of know how physical we're gonna be, how tough we're gonna be, how together we're gonna play, how much on the same page we're gonna be, culture of the defense, the togetherness the toughness, the, the way we want to take on blocks, the way we want to attack the ball, all those things. So I think there'll be uh, hopefully a lot of similarities to, to how we played at Michigan over the last year. I love how we are hearing the same sentiment from Greg Roman, Joe Hortiz, and now Jesse Minter. You have a scheme and an identity that you want to run on offense and defense, but you adapt how exactly that comes to fruition on the field with the players that you have and your personnel and who you are playing week to week in terms of like the offense that you're playing, who you're playing against, that changes. This is something that Brandon Staley could never really figure out because he had a scheme that he wanted to run, but he never adapted it to his personnel and put the players in a good position to succeed. And then he never changed it week to week based on who he was playing. A good example of that is freaking Kenneth Murray being dropped into zone coverage over and over again last year when he was clearly struggling to read and react to running backs in the flats and then tight ends running crossers behind him. Another terrible example of this is the entire JC Jackson tenure with the Chargers. Yes, JC Jackson struggled on the field, but a large part of that is Brandon Staley's inability to put him in position to succeed. I already talked about it like a month ago and also when it was happening, but week one, JC Jackson against the Dolphins, he's coming off a torn ACL and you line him up one-on-one -on -one against Tyreek Hill with no safety help? I mean, do you put any cornerback one-on-one -on -one against Tyreek Hill with no safety help? I mean, it, it was just, it was absurd to see and they got burned multiple times because of it. That's why they lost that game. The big three things with how Jesse Minter wants this defense to play are physicality, toughness, and togetherness. All three of those things were lacking last year. And those are all important things to play winning defense. Here is what Jesse Minter had to say about what else is important to playing winning defense. Things that are important to playing winning defense, block destruction, communication, ball disruption, effort and angles. We've added tackling in as another one. You know, that to me is the how, you know, like how you want to play. So when you turn on the, the Chargers tape or you cut tune us in on a Sunday, you know, I want there to be a level of expectation for the people watching and what they want it to look like. Bro, I just love the way he talks. Block destruction. But again, almost all of these things were lacking from the defense last year. And then two big things that I'm sure every freaking Chargers fan can identify easily from last year. It was the tackling that was missing and it was the effort and angles that was missing as well. I mean, the effort and angles that the defense showed last year, it was just absolutely terrible at times. I mean, look at the Raiders game. The second time that we played the Raiders and got blown out, there was no effort. The angles were really bad. Specifically, there was one play in the Ravens game I'm thinking about. And then also the tackling was even worse basically throughout the entire season. But the communication as well was really, really bad under Brandon Staley. And that is why we saw a lot of deep pass touchdowns. I want to show you two plays from last year. So this is the game winning touchdown pass that the pack had against the Chargers. Look at the communication between our two linebackers. Derwin James right here. Jasir Taylor looking down this way trying to figure out what's happening. 
Eric Kendricks tries to tell him what's going on. He tells Asante, and then Derwin James is trying to tell Kenneth Murray, hey, wait a minute, look at the bottom of the screen, because we have A.J. Dillon, the running back, with nobody on him. Michael Davis is trying to get his attention, too, saying, hey, we got a guy down here. I'm on this receiver. And so Kenneth Murray, right before the snap, he goes down, tries to get the running back on the outside, runs into Michael Davis, who is now playing catch up on this receiver who's just running this right up the seam vertical route towards the end zone. And then we have our deep safety, Derwin James, who's just going to get caught looking downfield right here and doesn't get depth. I, I, I mean, it looks like this is quarters, right? So it looks like Derwin James should have that deep part of the field probably help out Michael Davis, but instead it's just really poor communication. And that's what led to that game winning touchdown to Dontavian Wit or is that Romeo Dobbs? It's freaking Romeo Dobbs, bro. But the point still stands. I think this is quarters. Derwin James, he just kind of gets caught looking forward. I think it's because he's trying to make up for what Kenneth Murray is doing with this miscommunication, but still it's a touchdown. Michael Davis got beat, but really it was just a terrible communication error all around. Now let's look at the effort and the angles. We have Zay Flowers in motion towards the bottom of the screen. Essang Bassley is following him across the field down towards the bottom. And then we have Khalil Mack and Derwin James as the guys who are crashing downfield to take away Lamar Jackson. That's what Khalil Mack is supposed to do. And Derwin James is supposed to take out this outside uh, run in case he goes towards the sideline. Essing Bassi is the one who is supposed to take away the inside, but you see he overcommits with this angle towards the outside and it leaves this inside zone completely wide open for Zay Flowers to run all the way into the end zone for another game winning touchdown in a big time situation for the Chargers defense. Look at how this all developed. You can see Khalil Mack is clearly supposed to go for the quarterback because we have Derwin James going for the outside to take away the run. He does it really well. And saying Bassey needs to be way up closer towards this inside to not allow Zay Flowers to even get the freaking first down here, man. I mean, last year, teams were attacking the Chargers defense late in the game like that because they knew what the Chargers were going to run. This year, they're not going to know what Jesse Mentor is running. We want to change week to week in a sense of we don't want the other team to know what we're going to be in or know what we're trying to play. I think the disguise, the element of surprise is really important. And so we certainly want to have that. It's trying to create concepts of defense that the guys understand conceptually what we're trying to do. Different coverages, different ways to take a receiver out, different ways to disguise, different ways to pressure. Taking these concepts, trying to create really simple ways to make them maybe look different week to week. For our guys, hopefully it's layered in simplicity and it allows them to play really fast. But we want it, you know, for our guys to be like, hey, here's what we're trying to do. Here's looks we're trying to present. Now let's go play really fast and, and play at high speed level. Jesse Minter was one of the best in college football last year at pressure rate and also simulated pressure rate. So that means that not only was he blitzing a lot and winning with those blitzes, but even when he wasn't blitzing and just showing a blitz pre-snap, he was still able to get pressure because of the amount of confusion that he caused for opposing offenses. You talk about getting those offensive linemen in conflict. I mean, just look at all of these plays that I'm showing you right now. And these are against some big school teams like Ohio State, their biggest rival. That's like the Chiefs to us. Alabama and Washington. So he was able to out scheme all of these offenses week to week with a game plan that was not too complicated for college players. I think that's one thing that a lot of people kind of knock him for is that he wasn't able to do this in the NFL or like he hasn't proved that he can do it in the NFL. But he has proven that his scheme is simple enough for these young players to understand and difficult enough for other teams to figure out to the point where the Michigan defense is playing fast and physical. Meanwhile, the offense that he's going up against, they're playing catch up and trying to figure out where the pressure is coming from or if someone is even gonna blitz at all. So here's a good example in the Alabama game. We have the linebacker coming down the field, left tackle points it out right before this play starts, but no one else is looking at this. So now we have the edge and the linebacker coming from this side and we take that edge 
bring him back around to the inside on a stunt move so that the linebacker is one-on-one -on -one with the tackle and we already have this interior defensive lineman one-on-one -on -one with the guard and we have these three guys on the top taking away the center right guard and right tackle so it creates a one-on-one -on -one really with the running back and the running back doesn't even have his head up to figure out that this man is coming on the inside and the stunt move so he is the one able to get the sack the Bama quarterback, Jalen Milrow, was actually, you know, he's fumbling the ball right here. But it doesn't matter because look at how fast this pocket collapses and he is attacked by that man on the stump move. This is another good example of I don't know who is coming. We have this edge player right here, three men down on the line. And then Mikey Sandra still coming from that nickel spot. And he is coming on the blitz right between the guard and the tackle. And we have our big man, Chris Jenkins, one-on-one -on -one with the guard right here. A guy up top on the edge is dropping back into coverage. Jesse Minter loves to do that to create these mismatches on the line. It puts this tackle, look at this, puts this right tackle in such a bind that he doesn't even block anybody. He's looking at the guard. Chris Jenkins goes towards, or he's looking at the defensive tackle. He goes towards the guard. So now he's looking at the edge player. And also Mike Sandra still is coming. So he's put in such a blender that he doesn't even block any of those two guys. And this is all, let me go back. This is all on a four man rush because this edge player, we're dropping him into coverage. So the tackle and the left guard here are basically doing nothing. Meanwhile, it is a three on two against the guard and the tackle on the right side of the uh, offensive line against Chris Jenkins, Mikey Samrasol, and this edge player right here. That's just putting the offensive line in conflict with pressure on a four man rush. And I cannot wait to see the blitz packages that Jesse Minter is able to dial up for Derwin James. Check out what he had to say about DJ. Yeah, I envision Derwin just being an enforcer, being a leader, being able to do a lot of different things, but we also want him to play really fast. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when you get a guy like Derwin, imagination things of we could do everything with him. We wanna start off saying, hey, let's get him going. Let's get him feeling comfortable. Let's allow him to do the things that he does best, which is get around the ball and make plays. When I look at his most impactful plays, he's close to the ball. He's pressuring, he's blitzing, he's kind of playing with no fear. And so we want to take what our guys do best, what each particular player does best, and then try to, cr try to be creative in the ways in which we let them do what they do best. It almost felt like he was throwing some jabs at Brandon Staley when he was talking about Derwin James, didn't it? Like put him in good position and don't be too creative so you allow him to still play at a high level and at full speed so he doesn't have to constantly think about scheme and where he's supposed to be and getting other guys in position. I mean, it almost felt like he was the opposite of Staley this entire interview because just about everything that he said, like everything he said that he wants to emphasize on this defense was basically exactly where we struggled last year with Staley on defense. I cannot wait to see Derwin James and who else we have on this defense. Like if we keep Joey Bosa, I think we're also gonna have a resurgence with him because Jesse Minter, man, he can scheme up a guy like Joey Bosa. I know he gets a lot of hate, but I'm one of the few people that is actually willing to give Joey Bosa one more just prove it year because I've seen the talent that he has. He just needs to get that mental right. And a guy like Jim Harbaugh creating that culture, maybe that's what Joey Bosa needs. That's why I would give him one more year. Also, because of the contract situation with Khalil Mack and Mike Williams, Joey Bosa, honestly, is the easiest one to keep because he's the only one that you can restructure and save like 10 million unless we can trade him for like a third, maybe even like a fourth round pick. I might take that. But I talked all about the cap situation and the possible trades that we can make in this video right here. And I'll, honestly, if Joe Hortiz wants to keep all of these guys, here's how he can do it. 